Folks, we are coming to the end of the season of hope. Well, I hope not for sure. I mean, I hope the hope continues in the new year also, but for this season anyway, we come to the end of the season of hope, and uh, I'm excited to share this message with you tonight. Such a familiar story. The Christmas story is such a familiar story, but my prayer is that we'll all hear it, maybe in a little different way this evening, maybe pick up something new from the story that we haven't heard before. And uh, you're also going to have this voice over here. John Mentner is going to read the story for us this evening as we uh, go through this time together. And so maybe that'll help us all listen a little more closely too. But um, would you join me in a word of prayer? Let's just ask God to be with us during this time. Gracious God, thank you so much for this day. And thank you for the privilege of this Christmas Eve where we can all gather here together tonight to celebrate the birth of your son, Jesus to hear the old familiar story once again, but Lord God, give us some new insights. And uh, more than anything, I believe you want this story to be personal in our lives. And so guide us and direct us and speak to our hearts tonight um, as you get that across to us. But also help us to open ourselves up, Lord God, to whatever you want us to hear tonight. Again, thank you for this time. Bless it as only you can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I want to say Merry Christmas to everybody, and then I'm going to get into the Christmas story here a little bit and give you some background to the story that John's about to read to us. Um, Sometimes a little background helps us understand what the story is about. Um, This past summer, Jane and I were uh, vacationing up in uh, Door County, and one of our favorite things to do while we're up there camping and and that sort of thing is to go to a, a local bookstore. There's a bookstore in Fish Creek that is just unbelievable. I think it's the Peninsula Bookman or whatever. But we went there, and and I bought a book that's a real page-turner. I think everybody would be really thrilled. But anyway, but it was called The Twelve Caesars. And it was really about the Caesars, the ones who ruled the Roman Empire for so long, and these 12 people. And so it talked about uh, their life and their way of thinking and so forth. And it gave me some real insights into the Caesar that's being talked about in this story. And this is Caesar Augustus, by the way. Caesar Augustus is the one in the first line, I think, that John is going to read to us in the Christmas story. It kind of sets up this scene for us. And uh, Caesar Augustus, or Octavian was his real name, was the ruler of the entire Roman Empire. And that's what the story tells us. He was the great nephew of another guy who you may have heard of by the name of Julius Caesar. I think everybody's heard of Julius Caesar, if you read uh, your world history and so forth. Uh, But he was the great nephew, and this guy, this Caesar Augustus, was a born fighter. This guy was incredible. He came in, and he took over the Roman Empire, but not without a lot of work and not without a lot of military battles. He is the one that uh, overcame and kind of uh, won out to Antony and Cleopatra. He's the one that took care of that whole deal and uh, eventually became the ruler of the whole place. It's been said of Augustus that he entered into a Rome made of brick, but when he died, he died in a Rome that was made of marble. And so this guy really did a lot. He was the first Caesar to be called Augustus, by the way, Caesar Augustus. And Augustus was a title that was actually given to him by the Roman Senate, which meant holy or revered. And uh, this word actually prior to this was reserved only for the gods, you know, but now it was being used of their Caesar or the leader of their uh, whole empire here. And it was under Augustus' rule that real moves were made toward making the Caesar actually a god and people looking at the Caesar that way and people uh, acting towards the Caesar in that way. In fact, about the time Luke was writing our story for tonight, this comes out of the Gospel of Luke, this Christmas story, about the time he was writing that, many people in the Uh, uh, Roman Empire, especially in Asia Minor, actually adopted Caesar's birthday, September 23rd, as the first day of their calendar year. They developed a whole new calendar because their Caesar suddenly was a god, and this was that important. And so um, they hailed him as savior. There's actually, uh, if you like archaeology, there's actually an inscription that was found that hailed him the savior of the whole world. Historian John uh, Buchan tells us that when Augustus Caesar died, people actually comforted themselves by reminding themselves that Caesar was a god and gods do not die. And so here in this story, what we have is we have our uh, self-proclaimed, widely accepted God and Savior. Luke, however, is ingenious. The story that John is going to read to us tonight, the Christmas story, Luke wants us to see this history of Caesar, Augustus, and the Roman Empire as the backdrop for the story 
of the real Savior, the real Savior. Listen now as John reads to us the Christmas story from Luke chapter 2. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, his fiancée, who was now obviously pregnant. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her first child, a son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped in snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in highest heaven, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to the heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. Thank you, John. Folks, in contrast to Caesar's world, Mary and Joseph's story involves what I want to call the mystery of grace. It was the presence of God, just in a mysterious way that was involved with them, but God's grace not coming in this story to the proud and powerful, but to the poor and the humble. And contrary to most people's belief, in this story, it was the humble, poor, and powerless Joseph and Mary who ended up the adoptive father and the birth mother of the king of kings. One of the prophets, a prophet Micah, actually uh, prophesied about his birth 700 years before Jesus' birth. And here's what he said. He said, but you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, which is kind of a region there around Bethlehem, are only a small village among all the people of Judah. Yet a ruler of Israel will come from you, one whose origins are from the distant past. So a poor couple's journey to Bethlehem, from Nazareth all the way to Bethlehem, to pay their taxes, that's really what the census was all about, to pay their taxes was, was the backdrop and the story that really came to fulfill this prophecy. And folks, I want you to know as we begin this evening that the baby Mary carried was not a Caesar. This was not a man who would become God, but instead a far greater wonder. This was the true God who had become a man. And that is known, as John told us earlier, as the incarnation. That's the word that describes God becoming man. And so, folks, God gave us the greatest gift ever at Christmas time. He gave us the gift of himself. And it's the gift that we celebrate tonight. And along with that gift, we're given hope. And I want to talk about that hope for just a little bit here. In your bulletins is a little outline on the right-hand side of the open bulletin. If you want to kind of follow along with where I'm at, I've just got two or three brief things I want to talk to you about. But I really want to talk about this incarnation and how powerful this is. 
And so God gave us himself. This is unbelievable through the incarnation or the process of becoming human. Verse 6 again, and, and while they were in Bethlehem, the time came for her to have a baby. And so through this birth uh, uh, from Mary and Joseph and, and here in Bethlehem and through this birth, um, God became human. Why? Mostly, and I'll talk about other reasons, but mostly because God loves us. That's why God became human. Every time I come to this time of year, I can't help but think of a friend of mine who's been a professor of mine and, and a friend for years and years, and he ended up his career at uh, Asbury Seminary South, which is in Orlando, uh, but his name is Bob Tuttle, and Bob's written several books, but when he talked about Christmas, in some of those books he talks about Christmas and this whole birth story, here's how he talks about it. He says, man, he said, it must have hurt God, I mean really hurt for God to squeeze himself into the body of that little bitty baby. Have you ever thought about that before? I mean, think about it. God Almighty, the creator of the universe, squeezing himself into the body of a little bitty baby. Imagine that, if you can, if your imagination will go there. Imagine that with me. There's another commentator that talks about God's gift to us and how God became human, and he shares this. He said it was clearly a leap down. It was a leap down what happened here on this night, as if the Son of God rose from his throne in heaven, stood poised on the rim of the universe, and then dove headlong, speeding through the stars over the Milky Way to Earth's galaxy, where he then plunged earthward into a huddle of animals. Nothing could be lower. And then, the, and then Luke finishes up this story in verse 7 in talking about Mary when he says this. He said she, it was there, that she gave birth to her first child, a son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. You know the story. But picture Mary there on that night. What do new parents do when a child is born? I think this is the first thing parents do, whether they admit it or not but I think she was probably there counting his little fingers and little toes because that's what parents do, right? When your child is born, you want to make sure everything's okay, and that's what parents do. And then they wiped him as clean as they could with what they had to work with by the firelight in that cave where the animals were kept. Mary wrapped his little arms and leg with strips of cloth, kind of like a mummy. She was swaddling him is what she was doing because if he was swaddled, then he wouldn't cry and he'd be more calm and so forth. But uh, no one helped her. No one was there to help her. I mean, Joseph was there, but as we all know, what help is that, right? Jane just told me to stay out of the way. I don't know. You know, it's that kind of thing. But, um, but uh, no one helped her. And then she laid him in this feeding trough, this manger. We call it a manger. Folks, think about the incarnation for a moment. Think about God becoming human and what an incredible gift that is. Because I believe it provides a marvelous illustration for Christ's work in our lives today. Here's some things that I'm thinking about. Just when we need him the most, he enters into our lives, no matter how messy things seem to be. That's the way God works. Jesus is always there for us. Here's another truth. Jesus is always there for us in the midst of our complications, our hardships, and our very human situations. And that, folks, brings us hope. Thank you, God, for loving us enough to meet us right where we are. And the next thing I want to mention is this, that God gives us himself through the meaning of the incarnation, the deep meaning of this act. Verse 8 again, that night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. These were the third shift shepherds that were out there on, at night, you know, guarding the sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the, the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified. Folks, these third shift shepherds, these were tough guys. They had to be tough guys in those days, and they were terrified by what happened, and who wouldn't be? But the angel, what happened? The angel reassured them. Don't be afraid, he says. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. I'll get back to that. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. Folks, the great doctrine of the church is this, that the Son of God became a real human, not just someone who appeared to be human, but a real human being. When he was born, I believe here's what happened. God the Son 
placed all of his heavenly powers. He came off the throne to come here to earth. Remember that. But he placed all of his heavenly powers on hold and put them at the discretion of God the Father for a time when he came here to this earth so that he could experience this life just like we do. Though he was sinless, he had a real human body too. We see that in the, in the crucifixion and the time at the end of his life. He had a human mind and human emotions complete with in, the inerrant human weaknesses as well. And as a baby, a very real baby in the cradle, Jesus probably did what babies do. He was probably watching his hand close and open, wasn't he? Just amazed at that, just intrigued with that because that's what babies do. And because he was a real baby, I believe that's what Jesus did too. He didn't fake babyhood, and that's what I want you to know this evening. This our incarnation thing, this is real. He didn't say to himself something like this, you know, you all think I'm a pre-articulate baby, uh, discovering that I have a hand. Actually, I I'm God admiring my brilliant invention. I'm the creator, I'm your creator, and I understand every word you're saying. Do you think Jesus said that to himself? I don't think so. I don't think that was the case, not at all. Folks, Jesus wasn't pretending on this night. This was no prenatal spoof. He was a real baby. And God gave up a great deal in giving himself to us to make this happen. But he loved us that much. And in God's very real understanding of humanity, of our lives, brings us hope. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for letting go of the divine to truly connect with our humanity. And then finally, I want you to know this about the incarnation, that God gives us himself through the effect of the incarnation, what happens because of it. Listen to these verses again, beginning with verse 20. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Folks, they had to make a decision. They didn't have to do this. The angel said, this is what you need to do, but they didn't have, they could have said, no, I'm comfortable out here. I'm fine out here. This is where I'm good with my sheep and so forth. I don't have to do this. And yet they did this. And so just as they heard about, they hurried to the village and they found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in the manger. And after seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary... Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. You guys know the story. So soon the angels departed. The glory of, uh, of the lit countryside because of the angels being there kind of faded away. The stars reappeared and the shepherds were alone. But that didn't stop them, did it? from doing what they had to do. The angels told them what to do. They were obedient. They did it. Folks, I want you to know this tonight. It is not enough to hear about Jesus. It is not enough uh, to uh, peek in the manger and say something like, oh, how nice. What a beautiful scene that is. If you don't hear me say anything else tonight, hear this, please. The truth is, even if Jesus were born in Bethlehem a thousand times, but not within you, you would never know the life that God has for you. You'd miss it. The Christ who was born into the world must also be born into your heart and into my heart. Folks, the, the effects of the, the incarnation are absolutely plain as day. Uh, when you read scripture, when you look at this story, God becoming human was real. Christ's identity was complete. Jesus' understanding of our situation here is real because he's, he's been there and he's done that physically. He's been there and done that. His complete identification means this, that he can save you. Whatever your situation is, he understands because he walked on the face of this earth too. He went through what we went through here. And that baby, that baby that we celebrate the birth tonight, God's son, he demands our complete allegiance. He is the king of kings. Folks, he really did come into this world. He really did. And because that's true, he can now come into your heart and into my heart. So folks, as we celebrate the incarnation tonight, God becoming human, 
Let us now make this move. Let us in our heart of hearts lay our lives before him. Because as the song says, in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. Thank you, God. Thank you for understanding who we are and for loving us anyway. We appreciate that. Folks, this is the season of hope. We are finishing up this season of hope with the message tonight. We've been celebrating that the whole season of Advent, but I want to declare that this is also another season tonight. I want to declare that this is also a season of joy. Are you okay with that? Everybody loves joy, don't they? And this is one of God's greatest gifts to us. But this is also a season of joy. Christ really came for your joy and for my joy. That's how much God loves us. Do you remember what the angel said? Verse 10, the angel said very clearly in this story, but the angel reassured them, now don't be afraid. Shepherds, don't be afraid. He said, I bring you good news that will bring what? Great joy. Great joy to all people. Folks, God wants to live in you today. He wants to fill you with his spirit of joy so that you may know God's very best and so that others might experience that joy through you. Would you please join me now in thanking God for the hope and for the joy that we have received? Would you pray with me? Thank you, Lord God, for loving us enough to meet us right where we are. We cannot even put into words how much we appreciate that, how thankful we are for that reality. Thank you, God, for letting go of the divine for a time and your divine privileges so that you could experience life as we do, so that you could truly understand. And thank you, God, for coming to understand who we are and seriously for loving us anyway. Eternity is now ours because of the Savior you sent us, the very best gift. We offer this thanks today in the name of the Christ child, our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen.